being given to the right to arbitrate, but it is an example of how important it is that the citizens' freedom not just to contract, but to figure out how to mend their contractual relationships be given effect. Um, unfortunately, the French Revolution soon um, consumed that particular right. The Napoleonic Code, which followed a dozen years or so after the Constitution of Year One, took back many aspects of that right to arbitrate. And in a well-cited um, decision from the, the 1840s, about the same time Justice Story was expressing his skepticism about arbitration, um, the, the French Court of Cassation, as it, as it then was in a case called Prunier versus Alliance, held that agreements to arbitrate were effectively unenforceable. And it relied on reasoning startlingly like that of Justice Story, that arbitrators weren't versed in the law, that there was no appeal from arbitration and there wasn't appellate scrutiny, and so arbitrators might get um, decisions wrong and that the right of citizens to have access to national courts ought not be impeded. Um, the good news is that France ultimately um, rethought that particular position. In the, in the 1920s, it acceded to the Geneva Protocol on arbitral clauses, um, first in international matters, subsequently affirmed in domestic matters, um, giving effect to the basic validity of agreements to arbitrate, holding parties, when they had agreed to arbitrate, to their promises, and allowing them then to mend their relationship in the way that they had promised to do so. And more recently, in cases such as the Dalico decision in the, in the 1990s, um, the French Court of Cassation vigorously embraced the fundamental validity of agreements to arbitrate subject only to very limited exceptions. A similar development occurred in Germany. An initial strong start, the Prussian Civil Code in the 1870s um, affirmed the validity of agreements to arbitrate both domestically and internationally. German judicial decisions in the late 19th century early 20th century read eerily like decisions from jurisdictions like Hong Kong, like New York, like England today, upholding the separability presumption on the one hand, the basic validity of agreements to arbitrate on the other hand. You can go back to decisions from 1905, 1910, and they could have been written yesterday, quite literally, decisions by, by the German courts. Unfortunately, by the 1930s, the world had changed rather radically. The National Socialists, with their totalitarian vision of the state, adopted something called the 1933 Guidelines of the Reich regarding arbitral tribunals, which said, and I'll quote, from a state political point of view, a further spread of arbitration would shatter confidence in state jurisdiction and the state itself. And a leading commentator, a leading Nazi commentator, observed the national socialist state rejects, contrary to liberalists, arbitral tribunals. And the basic vision was that it was the state and only the state that was responsible for the rule of law, that arbitral tribunals chosen by parties for themselves frustrated, endangered, undermined, threatened the rule of law, and ultimately threatened the state and arbitration agreements were neither used nor, for the most part, enforceable in the 1930s and thereafter in Germany. But again, there was a good end to that story and a good end that also reflects the fundamental character, the basic character of the right to arbitrate. A judgment of the 23rd of August 1963 from the German Federal Labor Court was the pathbreaker in this regard. It relied on a provision of the German Constitution, Article 2 of the German Constitution, which guaranteed the right to private autonomy and individual freedom, to, to reason as following in upholding the validity of an agreement to arbitrate. And I'll quote again. The right to agree upon submitting a matter to arbitration is contained in the fundamental right to freedom of contract under Article 2. 
the restriction of state jurisdiction occurring as a result of the agreement to arbitrate is a result of the party's exercise of freedom to contract, a freedom which the court vigorously upheld. And that decision was followed in 2000, the judgment of the 3rd of April 2000 by the German Federal Supreme Court, um, the Bundesgerichtshof, which reasoned to the same effect, relying on Article II of the German Constitution, which in turn upheld the, the right of, of German citizens to develop their own autonomy, develop their own personality. And the court, the Supreme Court, rooted the right to arbitrate in that guarantee of autonomy. The case is actually a, a fascinating case. It involves, of all things, a German association for the breeding of German shepherds, German shepherd dogs, which contained in its bylaws an arbitration agreement. And the issue was, could a member of the German Shepherds Breeding Association be required to arbitrate his disputes with other members pursuant to the arbitration clause contained in the articles, the bylaws of this association. The court answered in principle yes, but not in this particular circumstance. The court answered yes because the fundamental freedom of contract and the fundamental freedom of association. You could choose whether you want to join this association or not. If you're going to join the association, then you're bound by it, both bitter and sweet. You get the benefits of the association as well as the agreement to arbitrate. That expression of individual autonomy and the freedom of contract and association deserved respect in the eyes of the court. The court said, however, in this particular case, we're not going to give effect to the agreement to arbitrate because as it happens, the association imposed the arbitration agreement on this particular member after the dispute had arisen. And the court said, well, that's not exactly autonomy or freedom of contract. That is a situation of coercion by a majority against a minority, which we will not give effect to. But importantly, the basic principle that if the association had adopted these, these bylaws, if a party had agreed to them or remained a participant in the association for a period of time before a dispute arose, then that agreement to arbitrate would be given effect as a contractual commitment. I mean, the same. The same principle, and Germany, of course, has adopted today the UNCTRAL model law, gives effect to agreements to arbitrate both domestically and internationally as a party to the New York Convention. And so rooted in the constitutional freedom of contract and individual autonomy, the agreement to arbitrate is given full effect today in German courts in contrast to the 1930s and the Nazi regime. The United States, a similar story. We've already seen the start of that story, Joseph Story's disdain for rough justice. That disdain lasted for some 50 years until 1925, the Federal Arbitration Act, which today has the somewhat mixed reputation of the oldest arbitration act in the world that's still in force. It's a mixed reputation because on the one hand, it's quite a good thing to have such distinguished historical lineage it's a bad thing because if your political process doesn't enable you to pass a new or better le piece of legislation, it raises some longer term questions. But we can worry about that on another forum. The important point for today's purposes is the Federal Arbitration Act in 1925 reversed the disdain that Justice Story held for arbitration agreements and instead gave effect to the validity of those agreements and again, as we have seen in France and in Germany, that respect for agreements to arbitrate was rooted in constitutional principles. Let me read from a decision from the Hawaiian courts, um, Kona Village Realty versus Sunstone Realty, which explained as follows. The recognized autonomy of parties to enter into an arbitration agreement is directly correlated to and stems from the constitutionally protected right of freedom of contract. And it's not just those jurisdictions. I've chosen Germany, France, the United States because um, they have particularly eloquent expressions of, of this right to arbitrate, but one can find it in, in multiple other places around the world. Um, in Panama, 
um, a, um, a recent amendment to the Panamanian Constitution adding Article 202 provided that in addition to a judicial branch consisting of the Supreme Court, courts and tribunals established by law, the administration of justice, and this is from Article 202, may also be exercised by the arbitral jurisdiction. The court may hear and decide for themselves, and by this they mean the arbitral court, may hear and decide for themselves about their own competence. In a recent um, Panamanian um, Supreme Court decision, interpreted that in the following sense. Arbitrators are judges by the sole application of the law and their decisions have coercive force towards the rest of the judicial and administrative community, thus giving the parties greater security that their claims are recognized through arbitral awards and shall be honored. This legal certainty in society will promote the choice of alternative dispute resolution mechanisms to the benefit of all, faster and expeditious justice, decongestion of courts, increased access to justice, which in a sense sums up, albeit from a somewhat small jurisdiction, um, quite eloquently the constitutional character and the importance of this right to arbitrate. I could go on with examples from other jurisdictions, Brazil, Venezuela, interestingly, Hong Kong, and elsewhere. Um, but the essential point is that national courts in multiple settings, in multiple parts of the world, in different periods of time, have recognized the fundamental character of the right to arbitrate as rooted in freedom of contract, freedom of association, individual autonomy. And as we're going to see, that recognition of the basis of the right to arbitrate has important consequences for today's law of arbitration and policy questions about arbitration. But before we turn to those implications of the right to arbitrate, I'd like to look at one other source of um, evidence, if you will, or confirmation of the enduring character of this right to arbitrate. And this is international tribunals. Um, I've already mentioned the New York Convention, which I've characterized as a, as a global constitution for arbitration. And by that I mean in particular Article 2 of the New York Convention, which provides in Article 2, 1, that contracting states, all 155 of them, which is one of the reasons I refer to the convention as a kind of constitution. It is essentially universal. It is global. Article 2, 1 of the convention requires contracting states to recognize agreements to arbitrate subject only to very limited exceptions. And Article 2, 3, of the convention then gives effect to Article 2.1's substantive guarantee by requiring courts in contracting states to refer parties to arbitration agreements to arbitration. Let's take an example, though, of how an international tribunal has given effect to that uh, provision, to Article 2 of, of the New York Convention. And I'm thinking in particular of the Saipan versus Bangladesh case a case arising under a bilateral investment treaty between a foreign investor and Bangladesh. The foreign investor, and I'll simplify the facts and, and move quickly through the holding um, in the interest of time, the foreign investor had an investment in Bangladesh. The investment had given rise to a dispute. The dispute had been resolved in an ICC arbitration, a commercial arbitration, seated in Dhaka, Bangladesh. The arbitral tribunal had ruled in favor at least for um, part of the dispute, of the foreign investor. At which point, Bangladeshi courts did a variety of things. They refused to recognize and enforce the tribunal's award, and they revoked the tribunal's mandate. Um, it's not exactly clear what it means to revoke a mandate, but the the Bangladeshi court reasoned that the arbitration agreement was in some manner invalid and that the arbitrators were no longer competent to continue in their role as arbitrators as a consequence. That led the foreign investor to commence a bilateral investment treaty, a bit investment arbitration against Bangladesh on the basis that its investment in Bangladesh which had been, it said, crystallized in the arbitral award, had been expropriated, or alternatively, that it, the foreign investor, had been denied justice 
by virtue of the Bangladeshi's court's treatment of the agreement to arbitrate. And the bi a bilateral investment treaty tribunal um, unanimously agreed with the foreign investor, holding that Bangladesh had denied the foreign investor justice by refusing to give effect to its agreement to arbitrate and by arbitrarily purporting to annul the arbitral award. Now, the tribunal recognized that the courts in the seat of an arbitration, and this is standard international commercial arbitration law in a sense, recognized that the courts in the seat of the arbitration had a particular supervisory authority with regard to arbitrations conducted there, but also held that that was an authority that needed to be exercised consistent with the New York Convention, which required, as I've said previously in Article 2, giving effect to agreements to arbitrate, and that annulment authority needed to be exercised not arbitrarily and capriciously without reason, and in this case in favor of a local state-owned company, but rather in accordance with the law. And, the, and the, the bilateral investment treaty tribunal therefore upheld the foreign investor's claim. The reason I've talked about that decision is that at bottom it is rooted in the same notion. The right to arbitrate is a fundamental right and the denial of that right is a denial of justice. Other arbitral tribunals have held precisely or almost the same thing. The ATA construction versus Jordan um, decision award has, has reached a very similar result. The white industries versus India um, decision has reached a similar result, relying on the all effective means um, provision of the relevant bilateral investment treaty. Um, rather than denial of justice, but in each case, the right to arbitrate has been um, upheld by the relevant um, bilateral investment treaty tribunal. And it's not just um, arbitral tribunals um, on an international plane, it's also the European Court of Human Justice. In, in two decisions, the Strand Greek refineries versus Greece case and the Kin Stib versus Serbia decision, um, the European Court of Human Rights found respectively both Greece and Serbia in violation of Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights guaranteeing access to justice because of a refusal by um, the two states, Serbia and Greece, to give effect to either an agreement to arbitrate in one case or an arbitral award in another case. Um, now, and what I would suggest is all of these various decisions by national um, tribunals, international tribunals and courts reflect the same underlying um, principle, the same um, underlying rule. Uh, the right to arbitrate is a fundamental right, a basic right rooted in principles of individual autonomy and freedom of contract which are at the foundation of the rule of law and ensuring respect for that right to arbitrate is no less important than ensuring um, access to justice. Indeed, in an international setting, international arbitration is the most effective means of providing justice. It is not rough justice or a second class citizen. It is a co-equal and essential means of providing justice. And I'll come back to that particular concluding remark in just a moment. What I'd like to do though, finally to conclude, is to look at practical implications of, of this principle, of this, this right to arbitrate. Why does it matter? Um, um, who really cares if it's, if it's important or fundamental or constitutional? Um, and it matters because of how a number of, of very important issues are considered. The first, the first issue that I, that I would like to look at is that of the validity of the, the arbitration agreement. Um, the, the importance, the existence and importance of the right to arbitrate um, um, is critical, firstly, because one continues even today to encounter decisions like that of the Bangladeshi courts. One continues to encounter decisions in some jurisdictions, more often at lower levels of the courts than higher levels, that deny the right to arbitrate um, and 
recognizing the importance of the New York Convention, the importance of, of Article 7 of, of the Unsatral Model Law, um, is fundamental in ensuring that individuals are in fact given the access to justice that they have agreed upon. Secondly, um, one often also sees, um, and this is related, one often also sees obstacles being placed in the way of enforcement of agreements to arbitrate. And these obstacles can take a variety of forms. They can take the form of heightened requirements of proof or validity. You can only have an arbitration agreement if it's particularly clear and explicit or if it satisfies heightened form requirements. And there's a, a Swiss federal tribunal decision um, from 2001 that, that helps illustrate this point and also underscores its, the, the practical importance of this point. One would have thought, given Switzerland's reputation as, as um, one of the homes, frankly, of, of international birthplaces of international arbitration, that Swiss courts would be particularly um, robust in their recognition and enforcement of, of international arbitration agreements, um, but, but not so always. Um, he, here let me read from um, uh, a decision um, of 16th of October 2001 by the, the Swiss Federal Tribunal. Um, constitutional law in Switzerland, Article 30 of the Federal Constitution, as well as treaty law, Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which I referred to previously as guaranteeing access to justice, afford each natural person and legal entity the right to be heard before a court established on the basis of statutory law. By submitting to arbitration, a party waives such right. Since this constitutes a deviation of a constitutional right, one must not conclude readily that the parties concluded an arbitration agreement if that issue is disputed. Rather, one has to make sure whether an arbitration agreement exists that binds the parties. And the court then proceeded to apply that requirement, saying that one cannot conclude too readily that there is an agreement to arbitrate, to hold that the parties had not agreed to arbitrate, where they had agreed that all their disputes would be resolved by the ICC in uh, Milan, um, a provision that I think most Hong Kong courts, most courts in other jurisdictions would conclude was a valid agreement to arbitrate, but which the Swiss court, because it imposed this heightened requirement for clarity and explicit um, reference um, to, to arbitration, refused to give effect to. Um, and I would submit that that is the wrong approach. I would submit that the right to arbitrate is no less important than the right to access to courts, and that that is uniquely true in international matters. Because in international matters, one, of course, isn't referring to access to a court. One's not referring only to access, for example, to Swiss courts, but instead, inevitably, to access to two or three countries' courts, each of whom will go forward, often in parallel proceedings, to produce judgments, which in the vast majority of cases will not be subject to any treaty like the New York Convention guaranteeing enforceability abroad. And at the end of the day, guaranteeing access to the other party's home courts in parallel proceedings to produce unenforceable judgments isn't providing access to justice, but it is in refusing to enforce the arbitration agreement, denying access to justice because justice in that circumstance is having the parties resolve their disputes in their contractually agreed manner, producing an award that is subject to recognition and enforcement in 155 jurisdictions around the world. And therefore, the better approach is, I would suggest, um, that of a US court in a case called Simula versus Autoliv, which held that as follows. The clear weight of authority holds that the most minimal indication of the party's intent to arbitrate must be given full effect, especially in international disputes. And if that reasoning, if that explanation sounds familiar, it is because it's eerily similar to our own reasoning 
here in Hong Kong in the Lucky Gold Star case, which happily upheld a decision can in uh, happily upheld the validity of an arbitration clause, which was as profoundly pathological, defective as most arbitration clauses that one will um, encounter in today's life. But it satisfied um, the most minimal indication of an intention to arbitrate standard and thereby guaranteed the party's access to justice as opposed to access to multiple court proceedings producing unenforceable decisions. Now, the same sort of approach can be taken with respect to the question of interpretation of arbitration agreements. Not a question about the validity of the agreement, rather how broad or narrow is the scope of this agreement to arbitrate. Now, there's an old American case um, uh, which held as follows. The agreement to arbitrate must be express, direct, and unequivocal as to the disputes to be submitted to arbitration, a very restrictive approach to interpretation. And I would suggest that this suffers from the same defects as um, the Swiss Federal Tribunal decision that I've referred to. It's rooted in a notion like that of Justice Story, that arbitration produces rough justice, that if you really have to have it, then it ought to be tolerated, but no more. It ought to be put in a little box that people can get out of only if they have been very explicit, direct, and unequivocal. The better view reflected not only in Hong Kong decisions, but also in English decisions, the Fiona Trust decision um, versus um, um, Privilov um, by the House of Lords, uh, the Mitsubishi Motors decision more recently in the United States both adopted so-called pro-arbitration um, rules of interpretation where the parties have agreed to arbitrate. You should assume that they wish to arbitrate all of their disputes, not just a few of their disputes. Yes, you'll give effect to express language carving out or excluding some dispute from arbitration, but you will require express language to conclude that the parties, once having agreed to arbitrate, only wanted to arbitrate a couple things, not the breadth of their relationship. And there's one final um, area um, that I'd like to address with respect to um, the implications of the right to arbitrate. And that involves um, some of the, the um, criticisms that one heard historically and still occasionally hears today sometimes as justifications for decisions like the Bangladeshi decision, justifications for a rule that arbitration agreements won't be valid, or justifications for the Swiss Federal Tribunal decision. Yes, they're valid, but only in, in extreme cases when there's a very compelling showing that such an agreement exists and it satisfies a series of formidable form and other requirements. Um, or sometimes simply, um, arguments for why mandatory procedural requirements should be imposed on, on arbitration. And I interestingly, these, these various um, um, procedural requirements all rest, when, when you look at them, uh, in, in the analysis, analysis that, that Joseph Story um, adopted 150 years ago. They all rest in the notion that arbitration is a kind of rough justice. It's a pale imitation, a second class citizen of national court proceedings. And we ought really either not therefore to enforce agreements to arbitrate or arbitral awards or alternatively make sure that arbitration is more like national court proceedings because then it will really